All right, let's, uh, let's talk about structures on the moon. Why don't you guys introduce yourself first? Jason, why don't you just tell us uh, a little bit about your background? Oh, my name's Jason Geis, and uh, I got interested in, I've always been a science fiction fan all my life, and then as I got a little bit older, I started to get interested in UFOs and some of the paranormal kind of stemmed right from my interest in science fiction. Um, I like science and science fiction, so I went into education. I got my degree at IUP in phys physics education. Uh, I've been teaching physics for about 10 years, and for the last year, I've been a MUFON field investigator. Okay, very good. James, tell us your background. Thanks, John. My name is Jim Krug, and I am currently the planetarium director at the Neil Armstrong Planetarium, which is in Altoona, Pennsylvania. And so I've always had an interest in space travel, and I think I first got interested in UFOs way back in the mid-80s. And I remember being at a neighbor's house to watch television there because we didn't actually have cable. And there was just a show on where they showed sort of the classic 1950s saucer shape with the antenna. And I remember the people having a serious discussion about whether or not that was a UFO from outer space. And I thought to myself, even back then, I was probably only six or seven, I thought, wait a minute, so there's a chance that these are actually real, that there's other life out there. And so ever since then, I've been interested in my background in astronomy. It sort of allowed me to fuse space exploration with that, which is part of what Jason and I are gonna be sharing with you today. Very good. Now, does uh, the topic of MUFON and UFOs ever come up at school or work or the planetarium where people ask you, you guys actually look into UFOs? Uh, does that ever come up at all? Uh, my students ask about it because at the end of the school year, uh, whenever the last couple of days after finals and whatever, I do presentations on different <coughs> paranormal topics. Like oh. I do a day on UFOs, um, day on ghosts and just different things like that and my students will ask you know well, what are you doing and i'll be like well i actually investigate mm -hmm. and i've had you know at the time uh this at the end of this school year i'd only had three cases and now i'm thinking about the five but i mean it was yeah. you know, so it's relatively new for me but i'm like actually i look into it and i do explain being a science teacher that what i like about move on is we um, are kind of trained to approach it from a scientific angle, yeah. actually try to look for explanations first before jumping to it has to be some aliens from right. another planet. So I mean, yeah, and, and the kids find it pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's and about all comes up for me. But. Does it come up with you at the? Uh, Absolutely. I actually, as part of my academic astronomy and astronomy courses, I have a fairly large section committed to the search for extraterrestrial life and. I went about it the right way. I made sure that I had administrative approval for my curriculum. And honestly, knock on wood, but in the 13 years that I've been teaching it, I, I've never had any issues. I will send a note home to parents at the beginning of the section saying, we're gonna be covering this. I'll try to do it as objectively as possible. If your son or daughter has any concerns, uh, they're welcome to sit parts of it out. And I've never had any issues, and I've actually found over the last couple years, people, students and adults alike are truly interested in this. When mm -hmm. I get questions as a teacher, the number one question is always, why isn't Pluto a planet? But number two is always about UFOs and extraterrestrials. In fact, this past year I did my first adult night sky study class, and this year, if all goes well, I'm adding a UFO extraterrestrial class, a nine-week course just for adults, and there's been a lot of interest in it so Good. far. Good. Now, you're also our <coughs> state section director there, and you've got a pretty big territory, right? Sure. And, and you've got, uh, what, a total of five investigators, including yourself in that area up there? Yeah, thanks, John. So Section 10 comprises the middle of the state, and it's Blair, Cambria, Center County, Bedford County. So it is a large area, and we do get a number of fairly interesting cases from there. And Jason's one of our field investigators, and then we have a couple from Bedford so far. Mm, okay. All right, let's get into the uh, structures on the moon. Tell us what's, what's there that they're not showing us. Well, there, there could be a lot more there than people think. And when you first hear structures on the moon, <clears throat> you automatically assume that that can't be true. But even NASA itself was preparing for this eventuality. Back in 1953, they convened what was called the Robertson Panel. And it was a group of well-respected scientists talking about as man started to explore the inner solar system, 
what should they do if they find structures from earlier civilizations? And even at the time, it was assumed that it was very likely that they could find structures on Venus, the Moon, and Mars. And the recommendation of the panel, which many people think is still held by the government today, is if structures are found, they should do their best to keep that from the public because it would be too upsetting for the public to find out about. Mm -hmm. Jay, anything else on the Robertson panel before I get into some of the cases? No, I mean, I just think it was very interesting whenever I was doing my research on this, because I'd never heard of the Robertson panel mm -hmm. before, that back then, uh, you know, years before you know, Kennedy made the mission to go to the moon, they were already saying, hey, if we go there, if we find stuff, it's probably a good idea not to let anybody know. So yeah. Well, that one was. thing with the Robertson panel, and uh, Captain Ruppelt didn't know it at the time because he sponsored this whole panel, it was stacked with CIA hand-picked scientists. Even mm. though they were credible, they were, they were people who were in bed with the CIA. Yeah. And, and there was an objective there not to tell the public. Yeah. So, Sure. Yeah. So right from almost the beginning of U.S. and Soviet exploration of the moon, we have some pretty interesting things appearing. The first one that we know of comes from the Soviets, and this was 1965 from their very successful Zon space probes. This is actually on the far side of the moon. And one thing I would like to explain very quickly to our viewers, people talk about the light and dark side of the moon. There really is no such thing. In fact, if you listen to the whole Pink Floyd album, at the very end of Dark Side of the Moon, there's an explanation <laughs> yeah, yeah. right, telling that. Yeah. So basically, as the moon orbits around the Earth, it is rotating, but its rotation matches its revolution. So basically, in one full monthly loop around the Earth, every part of it is illuminated by the sun. What we do have, though, is a near side and a far side. So the far side is the side that always faces away from the Earth. So the only people to see that in person would have been the Apollo astronauts as they orbited around it. So this is from the far side of the moon, and it was just dubbed the Tower of Babel. And it is about 22 miles tall. Now, even if this has nothing to do at all with extraterrestrials, it clearly calls the formational history of the moon into question because we are told the moon is basically about as old as the earth and because it has no atmosphere to protect it like the earth it has been pummeled continually for billions of years by debris and so the theory is everything on the moon should basically be smoothed down over time there's still mountain ranges but everything is beat down and so we shouldn't have structures protruding 22 miles up into outer space. Well, it turns if, out, oh, go ahead, please. Just before you go on with that, uh, along the same lines, and you could probably explain this a lot better with your degree, but uh, there's a lot of inconsistency just on the moon itself. Like, the, you know, like there, even in science now, there's not a 100% this is how the moon was formed. And there's a lot of like weird I got questions about that. Yeah, yeah, the theory. Yeah, yeah, there's some, there's some, and some people even think that maybe, you know, there, uh, in Jim Marr's book, The Alien Agenda, he talks about there's a theory that maybe the moon was, is basically, basically like a giant, you know, Death Star or space station of some ancient civilization that came in. And there's just some weird inconsistencies with the moon itself, which is... Is it unusual, or do other moons <coughs> rotate around their planet where you only see that side? Is that like only our moon does that? Because we never see, we always see the same mm -hmm, side. Right. I mean, for it to be in sync like that, like a gear, it, it just seems phenomenal. That Do all moons do that? Do some moons do that? That's a great question. That is, it is called tidally locked, and it is a fairly common thing within our solar system to have moons where one side always faces the host planet. Okay. What's uncommon though is how large Earth's moon is compared to the Earth because it's the fifth biggest moon in the solar system and the only four moons that are bigger orbit around Jupiter and Saturn which are much, much more massive than the Earth. So the size of the moon itself in comparison to the Earth is very unusual. Yeah, it's a quarter of the size of mm -hmm. the Earth, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. huge. And I mean, that theory that it was a small planet that hit Earth and then it, you know, part of it all what pulled away. My question is if it hit Earth, even if Earth was molten at the time, 
I mean, the moon, to be perfectly round after a collision, it would have to be spinning, you know, like pottery and become round again. How does it hit the Earth, not explode, because that's what, isn't that what the Kuiper belt and the asteroid belt is? Maybe a planet that got hit. Mm -hmm. How does it become perfectly round after a collision? Why isn't it shaped like a banana? <laughs> well, over billions of years, if something is massive enough, they say that gravitationally, yeah, they, they try to explain it, it with the gravitational pull. It pulls all the yeah, matter back in. Pull it back. Mm -hmm. And the one theory that I read, but again, I, like I think it's just interesting that you know it's our closest neighbor. We've studied it a lot, and there's still no scientific consensus on this is definitely how the moon was yeah. formed. Like there's mm -hmm. a lot of different things. But one of the theories that they say is that whenever it hit, and yet, uh, if you go with the collision theory is the earth was kind of a you know molten still kind of forming thing and at the same time the moon was a little more molten so they were both kind of like you know a little less solid than they are now mm -hmm. when they hit and then that matter flew up and then the masses of uh, uh, gravitational attraction is what pulled them into this mm -hmm. spherical shape is how, how they try to explain I it. I think but a lot about, of their theories. How about if it was man made or made by someone or something? That put flew up it over. From, that was well, that well, And that's one of the things that in Jim Mars book, The Alien Agenda, he right. talks about. And it's very, I, I find it very interesting. Because they it, say if you, if you actually, like you're digging or you're hitting down, you're actually hitting like metal down there. Well, yeah, they so. left those, uh, if one of the Apollo missions, right? They, they had put some seismographs on the moon. And when they took off, the stage, booster stage fell back. It landed on the moon and it, it echoed through uh -huh. like a well, bell. Right. And there, <clears throat> to your point, there are lots of large hollow areas within the moon. So on Apollo 11, as John said, they put these seismographs and they assumed moon quakes would be very, very rare. <clears throat> well, what they found couldn't be further from the truth. They were happening all the time. And if the moon is truly geologically dead, as scientists say, they shouldn't have been. And on, it was actually, I believe, Apollo 13 was the first time they didn't. Since they had the aborted landing, they still took the descent stage and allowed it to impact the moon. And they assumed that the moon would only vibrate for a few seconds. But in reality, it rang like a bell for over a half an hour. Mm -hmm. And the only way this would be possible is if there were large hollow areas. And this isn't just science fiction. NASA has actually taken this serious, seriously enough that in 2013, they had the GRAIL mission, where they had two space probes orbiting the planet, or the moon, sending radio waves through and measuring when they would come back to more accurately map the hollow areas. So mm -hmm. it's not science fiction. There are large hollow areas, and NASA has taken it seriously. Okay. So on with some of the structures. NASA has found the same things. These are two of the more famous ones. This is from Lunar Orbiter 3. So in advance of the man landings, they had a lot of very successful orbiters. And these became known as the tower and the shard. Now me personally, I find the shard to be a little more credible than the tower. Lots of people have inferred shapes in the tower, maybe. To me, this one looks more like a lens flare. But the shard itself, said to be upwards of four miles high, not only appears more credible to me, but they've actually photographed it from different positions. And if you look closely, you can also see a shadow mm -hmm. from the shard on mm -hmm. the lunar surface. Some people mm -hmm. liken it to one of the Easter Island Moy. And I think you want to be careful not to infer too much, but just like the Soviets, you once again have a structure sticking very high up off the moon that probably shouldn't be there. This is also from Lunar Orbiter 3. When I see these, I try to look for skeptical explanations, too. I try to look for both sides. The only thing I can find about this one, some people claim they are marks from glue that were made as part of the photo process. But this is on the far side of the moon again. It's the part we don't see from Earth. And this line here, the day-night line, would be called the Terminator. And you can see all along the Terminator what appear to be very symmetrical surface lights along it. Once Apollo astronauts begin to go to the moon, so the Apollo missions, most of them went to the moon. Uh, most of them were manned landings. There were three astronauts. One stayed in what was called the command module orbiting, and the other two descended down to the surface in what was called the lunar module. And so this is Apollo 10. This is basically the dress rehearsal for Apollo 11, which was the first manned landing. So they didn't actually land. The lunar module wasn't ready yet, but they did go to the moon and orbited it. This became known as the castle, and even though it's tough to maybe deduce much structure out of it, the one interesting thing about the castle 
is it appeared not to be on the surface, but actually floating above the surface. And they determined this by parallax. They photographed it from multiple places, and they could see the moon's surface changing position underneath it. And so the only way that some believe that would be possible is if this structure was actually floating above the moon. And this would have been well in advance of the US or the Soviets having any permanent satellites around it. So we start to see weird things in the Apollo era. We also have had former there's NASA probably, and, oh please. Well, uh, one of the things in Apollo 11, uh, and there's some, you know, some skepticism on my part and on other people's part, but it's very interesting. Well, after Neil Armstrong made the famous, uh, you know, one uh, small step speech, uh, there's a part where it sounds like, and if you listen to transmission, it sounds like he says something about seeing a light. And then after you kind of hear that, the communication was lost for two minutes. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's, this is all well documented. I mean, that definitely happened. But ham operators. Yeah. Say, and, yeah. Uh, and so supposedly uh, some ham operators intercepted Neil Armstrong's communications during that two minutes. And the theory is that they switched to like a private channel mm -hmm. that couldn't uh, hear everything. And, and, you know, not for the public. And the transcript is, you know, Mission Control says, you know, what's there? This is Mission Control calling Apollo 11. And I have it written down so I don't misquote it. Uh, and then Apollo 11, you know, Armstrong comes back. These babies are huge, sir. Enormous. Oh, God, you wouldn't believe it. I'm telling you there are other spacecraft here lined up on the far side of the crater's edge. They're on the moon watching us. And that's part of the transcript of what supposedly happened. Um, a little uh, skepticism on my part is just one of the weird things that's kind of strange is if you listen to any old um, communications, they never refer to themselves as mission control. It's always Houston to Apollo. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and it's just weird to just, tra you know, this transcript, I suppose, which makes me wonder, okay, did this really happen or not? But what's definitely without, you know, undebatable, there were two minutes during that broadcast where mm. the signal this, you know, well, and the official story was that one of the cameras overheated, which a lot of people find weird that you spend all, you know, why didn't you think about like those kind of, you know, you were preparing for this monumental thing, really a camera's gonna overheat, but you know. Well, it's what, like the missions over um, the Sedonia area of Mars to, to re-photograph the face two missions in a row cut out when it was over it, so they couldn't take those mm -hmm. pictures. Mm -hmm. But the other thing with that though, Fred, let me just add this is, the communications director, Maurice Chatillon, very, said that that happened. Yeah, and yeah, this I'm is the guy that's in charge. I, I forgot the gentleman's name, so that's yeah, why I didn't want yeah, to yeah, mention yeah. it, but I remember yeah. reading that, yes, the one guy, and it's not like it's someone this is a that's big shot the there. street. Yeah, it's yeah. a guy that was there said that's what happened. When, when he was coming down the steps, who took the picture? Well, that is, some people cite that as part of the moon conspiracy, but there is actually a piece on the lunar module that folded out that actually had a camera on it to be able to take a picture back at it remotely. So, I mean, there are some curious things that we could definitely cover in the future. The that flag, one, you know, yeah. Yeah, that one is, is pretty What different. do you think about the possibility? You know, you think about Apollo 13 had all those problems and it didn't land, right? And was mm -hmm. lucky to get back. Mm -hmm. And then you look at those theories that did we really go because there was this race with, with the Soviet Union. What do you did, is it possible that 11 and 12 were staged? The first real attempt was 13 and it had all kinds of problems. So then 14 was the first actual landing. I mean, it kind of yeah. timeline uh -huh. makes sense that we couldn't do it, so we staged it. And that's where, you know, they talk about the flag, there's no dirt on the pods, it, mm. when it blasts, there's no hole. You know, mm. there's a lot of things there that, 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 what do you think about that possibility that Edgar Mitchell was actually, actually the first one on the moon in Apollo 14? Wow. And why didn't we ever go back? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's uh, a big question. Well, that's one of the things through, like, you know, when we were con when contacted, you know, and started looking at this topic, one of the theories out there of why we have stopped going is because of the alien bases on the moon. We were basically told, uh, and I think about, and I know, John, you've said before how you're kind of a science fiction fan as well, uh, but in 2010, the sequel to 2001, whenever the life comes up on the, uh, planet Europa, like, Earth gets that message the rest of the solar system's yours, but stay away from you know, Europa. Mm -hmm. And I kind of wonder, like some people think that maybe the uh, there were 
alien entities on the moon and they're like you know okay through com conference you know and again i wasn't there and so but this is a, the theory uh but through discussion okay you mapped out so many missions we're going to allow you to finish those missions but after that don't come back is, mm. what, is one of the theories and i don't know mm. if that's you know, obviously what's I, true or not true but i think there's any number of theories and this is part of the reason that i find the moon so fascinating the more you read the less you really know for certain all I can say with utmost certainty is there's a lot more to these missions than meets the eye. It could be something like that. I've also even read that Werner von Braun, the head of NASA at the time, when they were planning out the Apollo missions, they had basically planned in advance on the assumption that probably at least one of them was not going to go well. Some people thought that's just planning to be safe. Other people looked at the political climate then. By Apollo 12, the second man landing, people had already begun to lose interest. And so there was literally billions of dollars in contracts sitting out there that potentially weren't gonna be fulfilled. But then Apollo 13 suddenly gets everybody around the world very reinvigorated in the idea of going to the moon because it was a near disaster. So there's even the angle, could this have been a planned catastrophe to get people re-energized in it so we could finish the mission. So there's so many ideas out there. And one of the things, you know, and then you know, continuing on with this idea of structures, there are some people that think that we knew before the moon mission that we were going to find, uh, and I think it was in a dark uh, mission, the one book, uh, where they kind of talked about that, where they think that they knew somehow from telescopes observation uh, lights that were seen on the moon that there's a good chance we we're going to find it aliens up there and that was really part of the mission and one of the things they point to is like in Apollo 11 they left a gold palm branch as a symbol of peace and a record or it wasn't actually a record but a record like mm -hmm. thing that had like greetings from a whole bunch of people uh, on earth like if why would you leave that on something you thought was a barren lifeless rock well, yeah, unless right. you thought there was a reason to leave that on a barren and the Voyager rock. mission we sent that gold plate yeah, exactly. with everything uh -huh. on it because they, they know it's out there uh -huh. somewhere and you know you think about any expedition that ever took place in the 1800s 1900s there was always way stations there had to be a place to go to restock to do whatever the moon is like a perfect place to be to run missions to the earth uh -huh. <laughs> why, would they, you know? why, would, why would you build a space station when you have the moon there yeah, I mean, uh -huh. you know, because once that's you're the up thing, there, it ain't you know. yeah. that much harder to keep going. And was there any explosions up there lately? Did we send any yeah, missiles up missile. there? Uh, right. Well, um, the idea has always been around. Even during the Cold War, the United States actually had an idea on paper to detonate a nuclear weapon on the moon so that the Soviets could see it as basically a threat to the Soviet Union. Um, we have seen a lot of what are called TLP, transient lunar phenomenon, and they've been recorded ever since the Middle Ages, basically bright outbursts of light and gas on the moon. So once again, even if it has nothing to do with aliens, clearly the moon is a lot more active than they say uh, it to, is. To your question, uh, Fred, um, I'm not sure if this has been, it's not super recent, but in 2009, it was the, was it the L-Cross mission? Yes. Where it was basically a mission that they were trying to test for water, and they took a, a crater, big right? payload yeah. and just crashed it into the, right. um, you know, moon and then did some things. And they found out there's a lot more water on the moon than anyone ever thought before, officially. What, it, you know, what I found interesting as I was looking into things and, you know, you guys know as well as I do, when you get on the internet, you can start going down rabbit holes and going mm -hmm. into whatever. But a lot of people think that the real purpose of that mission was to take out uh, an alien structure or an alien base that was on the moon. And, you know, the cover story was we were doing this research. You know, again, you know, I can't find any corroborating okay. proof to that. But. We all know the government lies. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> They're very good at that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, very quickly, we do have a number of other cases. We actually have former NASA employees, including Miss Donna Hare, that have come forward that said part of their job at NASA was to actually airbrush structures off the moon. And you can find a number of pictures of this. And interestingly, it just goes to show you should save anything you find on the internet. Back in the mid-2000s, NASA released their first ever high-resolution pole-to-pole map of the moon to the public. And I and other people were shocked to see there was a lot of places where it looked like there was very poor photoshopping jobs done. They had basically cut and pasted different pieces of terrain 
the, tur the, the structures didn't match, the color didn't match, over top mm. of other areas. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is amazing. So I bookmarked the site, but I went back a few weeks later and then all of those things were gone. So it just goes to show you if you find a good image, a good video on the internet, it's definitely good to back it up to your own computer. Mm -hmm. Very quickly in 2009, this was during an otherwise mundane NASA documentary, an employee was interviewed and this picture of the moon's surface was on his desk and when it was magnified very closely, you could see definitely a cube-like structure. Now some people think this was accidental, others think that these things are intentionally put out there to gradually assimilate the public to the idea mm. of structures on the moon. So if and when it is revealed, it isn't as upsetting to them. And just one or two more I wanted to share. This was first photographed on Apollo 8 and then re-photographed on Apollo 15. It appears to be an anomalous object lodged in a crater on the far side of the moon. The crater is called Isaac D. And this is actually the topic of a hot mission that's been over the internet ever since 2008 that is a supposed secret mission to the moon to explore this object called Apollo 20. The last thing I wanted to show you though is this really unique mission patch. When NASA would design mission patches, a lot of times the astronauts would take the first shot at it. And this is actually a rejected mission patch designed for Apollo 17. It was designed by Jack Schmidt, one of the astronauts, and it very clearly appears to show Stonehenge on the surface of the moon. So kind of a neat one there. That's cool. Well, in our next episode, let's talk a little bit about Apollo 20. We're almost out of, out of time uh, with this one. Uh, any other closing comments before we end this episode and go into the next one? Anything else on these structures you want to add? Uh, this is, it's, I, I find it very interesting, and as Jim said, and as we kind of talked about, is uh, regardless if we know for a fact that they were, are definitely extraterrestrial or if they're natural or whatever, there's a lot of to the moon that we don't know yet, and it's just an interesting Sure. Yeah. And I would just encourage our viewers, if this stuff is interesting to you, look it up on your own, because these things are out there, but this is not the type of stuff that you're going to see covered on the 6 o'clock news. Yeah, unfortunately. Okay, yeah. well, that's the end of our first episode. Don't go anywhere, because we're, <laughs> we're doing an episode two on this, and we have more information to cover. So great job on episode one. Thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, guys, we're back for part two of, of our information on the moon and, and structures and the Apollo mission. So uh, tell us a little bit about this uh, Apollo 20, even Apollo 19. I think there was, was there a movie that kind of claimed there was an Apollo 19 also? Oh, Apollo 18. 18, whatever it was. Okay, yeah. Sure. Uh, well, the quick background is the official Apollo missions went up to Apollo 17, and at the time, the Apollo program was actually using up about 10% of the gross domestic product of the entire United States. So the official story is the Apollo missions were ended with Apollo 17. And after that, there was the Apollo Soyuz test project, which is where the US and the Soviets met in Earth orbit, sort of a symbolic ending or a hopeful ending to the Cold War. But there were other planned Apollo missions. They had actually planned up to Apollo 20. And even when the Apollo missions were canceled, a lot of the hardware, the Saturn V rockets, everything like that, was already actually made. And so the mainstream explanation is that all of this was simply either scrapped or was given over to museums. But back in 2008, a very interesting story emerged. A man came forward named William Rutledge, and at the time he was 74 years old and he was actually living in the African nation of Rwanda. And he came forward with an incredible account that he was actually part of a secret mission run by the National Reconnaissance Office to explore a structure on the far side of the moon, which was photographed in multiple previous Apollo missions. It was three to four kilometers long, and it appeared to be lodged in the side of a crater. Now, the skeptical explanation is that this is not actually a structure at all, that this is just sediment filling in the crater. But a lot of people have pointed out, especially if you look right here, you can see what appears to be a shadow protruding from the object onto the lunar surface. And so this began the legend of Apollo 20. So according to Rutledge, he and a woman named Marietta Snyder, along with a famous cosmonaut <coughs> named Alexei Leonov, 
actually went on a secret mission to explore the far side of the moon. Now, nobody prior to this had heard of Rutledge or Marietta Snyder, but everybody had heard of Alexei Leonov. He's one of the most famous Soviet cosmonauts. He was the first man to walk in space. Since Yuri Gagarin's untimely death, he's basically the most famous surviving Soviet cosmonaut. And so if you are making a hoax, the sort of double-edged sword <clears throat> with using somebody famous is, people know this famous person very well. You can see if there's a contradiction to the story. Apollo 20 supposedly launches in 1975. This was after Leonov would have gotten back from the Apollo-Soyuz joint project. And this was prior to him being named the chief cosmonaut, which is an honorary position in the Soviet Union. He was in the United States at the time, and so the time frame basically fits. Adding to Rutledge's story, he released a lot of videos from this mission. Now, according to his account, the reason he had the videos is because Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, which is supposedly where this secret mission launched from, was having some of their buildings torn down, and a security guard there knew, Le er, knew um, Rutledge and was able to actually get the tapes to him. And it sounds far-fetched, but understand NASA themselves lost or recorded over multiple tapes from the Apollo mission. So it was not Which uncommon, is incredible. I know, for them to be so cavalier with these things. <clears throat> the first few tapes he releases are absolutely phenomenal. They show very close flyover footage that would be very, very difficult to replicate. Not impossible, but rather difficult. They show interior shots of the lunar module, and where it became incredibly controversial is they show the interior of what appears to be a crash structure on the moon, where they uncover what appears to be a hibernating female extraterrestrial. Some of the last original footage is showing them actually recovering this female extraterrestrial, who is dubbed the Mona Lisa due to her similarity to Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa. And they actually have her in a hammock inside the lunar module on the surface. Now, in terms of containment and making sure everything's quarantined, it appears highly unlikely that they would ever put a freshly thawing extraterrestrial entity inside the ship. But the one perplexing part is some of the interior shots of her actually show footage of Rutledge and Leonov, and it looks exactly like Alexei Leonov. So if this was a hoax, they found a perfect doppelganger for Leonov. And the one other thing I wanted to say about before I turn it over to Jay, since then, a lot of other footage has come out about Apollo 20, and it doesn't look nearly as good. It mm. looks rather hoaxed. And so for a lot of people, that to them is the end of the story. Well, the whole thing must be a hoax. But personally, I don't think you can rule out disinformation because in the day and age of the internet, if something really good is put out there, it's no longer attempted to be totally removed from the internet because you can never get it gone. Too, too many people mm. save it to their computers. A far more effective method is to make something of much lower quality and re-release it as part of the original. And so the debate continues today, but personally, I think it's a fascinating account. Mm. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I don't know nearly uh, as much about Apollo 20 as uh, Jim does, but I did, like, the video is kind of compelling. Like, even little things, uh, like when they show some of the crew working on the capsule mm -hmm. and, like, the logos on their back, like, it was like, and I forget, Jim might be able to add, but it was like a company that, like, you never heard of that very few people know had a contract with NASA. So like, if, you know, like for the average person on the street that's gonna fake that, how would you know to make sure you put, and I forget the company's name, but how would you know to make sure you put that company's name mm -hmm. on the back mm -hmm. of these? So I mean, it is, it's an interesting video, but I, I have not looked into it a lot mm -hmm. to know a whole lot about Apollo 20. Absolutely. Um, just uh, one last thing that I had on is, think about it from a purely civilization standpoint. We look at these smaller species on Earth and we know that if something happens, to their niche if it is polluted or destroyed, the species usually perishes. And so we naively think, well, us humans are fine, we're all over the whole Earth. But on a more cosmic perspective, the Earth is really just one niche. And so if something happens here, whether it's nuclear war, whether it's a runaway greenhouse effect, whether it's an asteroid collision, that could basically be the end of our civilization. So to me, it's vitally important that we get human colonies on the moon 
and on Mars. And I do think there's a chance that we have them today already, but if we do, it would be entirely through black budget programs that we and the public would never find out about. Yeah. Well, you know, there's another theory, too, that it's cheaper to go deep under the Earth and build these colonies oh, okay. mm -hmm. that would protect you against yeah. asteroid strikes and stuff like that. But I think you go almost have to be in two locations. And I also think that there's a chance that, you know, Mars did have civilizations and they knew of something coming like a, a big asteroid strike or something and they mm -hmm. left and came here. Mm -hmm. Very possible. Yeah. I think <clears throat> there's a very good chance of that, especially when you look at the analogies between some of the structures supposedly seen on Mars versus what the Egyptians have today. Mm. And even if you look at what some of the remote viewers say about Mars, I don't want to get too much into remote viewing, but a lot of people believe, like you said, Mars was inhabited long ago. And one of the interesting theories I read was that it didn't actually get hit with something, but something passed so closely to it that it basically made a standing wave through the atmosphere, mm. which gradually reflected off of itself and caused more of the atmosphere to escape into space. And interestingly, um, even in mainstream mm. science, they are now coming around to a new theory. They believe Mars didn't actually lose its atmosphere gradually, as they say, but they think that they actually lost it very rapidly from one cataclysmic event. Yeah, I, I've always thought something very large passed so close, it just ripped the atmosphere uh, yeah. right off. Mm -hmm. It just took it mm -hmm. with it. I mean, it might, I mean, we have a, a small three quarter mile asteroid, Apophis, in 2029, that's actually gonna dip below our satellites. Exactly. I mean, 46 yeah. miles away from Earth, it's coming in within 46 miles of Earth. Mm -hmm. Three quarters, you know, it, it's actually trajectory on uh, Nigeria, which would take off that whole uh, uh, western side of Africa, yeah. northwestern, if it's if it struck. So, mm -hmm. who knows what what the uh, truth <laughs> is? I do want to talk about. You guys have anything else to add yeah, on this? Because yeah, I want to. This goes right into it uh, with Kennedy. But before we get started on that, let's just uh, talk about a couple of things. Fred, we did the. Uh, Kecksburg UFO conference this past weekend. Right. And I, I think we've done maybe six, eight years of doing it. Right. This was the heaviest rain I've seen, oh, yeah. the smallest yeah. crowd that I've seen. But I, I did find out something there that I never knew, that when you were down in, uh, in Fayetteville, you were referred to as the James Bond of Vietnam. <laughs> they say, well, thank you. Uh, they say in your younger days, you kind of look a little like Sean Connery, and, and you're the man I down there. Yeah. Thank you. We might refer to you, the James Bond of Vietnam. Uh, Bond, James Bond. Well, that's what I said, James Bond <laughs> of If Fayette I could Nam. only have the women he had. Uh, I agree with you. Hey, the other thing uh, quickly I want to go into is, uh, it's amazing how a lot of these people on websites and radio shows, and I call them the MUFON haters, uh, anytime they get anything about MUFON, right away they're, they're, you know, they got to tear into MUFON, they have no idea what they're talking about. And I'm referring to uh, Lon Strickler and uh, Phantoms of, and Monsters. He right. sends a daily email. I mean, his latest thing, and, and this all stems from you not agreeing with him and Butch Witkowski on the Todd C's investigation. Right. But, but the latest thing was <clears throat> that uh, MUFON named you the crypto expert for the, you know, 10 cases a year we get where right. Bigfoot is seen with, with the UFO. Right. But their response is, well, MUFON's taking over Bigfoot investigations. MUFON's um, membership is so bad, they have to start doing ghost and Bigfoot investigations to get new members. And the truth is the exact opposite. Our membership in the last two years, because of the Hangar One TV show, mm -hmm. our membership is up 50%. We have over 4,000 members now worldwide. And we are not looking to do Bigfoot investigations. I don't well, know if you want to I, add anything to I, that. I, I think it, what we're doing is we're looking at uh, the, the last humanoid group that we had in MUFON. We're actually using their, their bases there. Um, the only thing we actually do is if we get a call, we investigate it. Okay? Um, if we get a call about a Bigfoot, we're going to investigate it. Okay, we get a call about the dog man, we're going to investigate it. But we're not going out looking for investigations. 
But I think with, with Lonnie, um, Lonnie hates us, but every day he puts a, a MUFON uh, case on his website. Okay, but what I'm thinking he's doing is, it's like he once called me the green-eyed monster that I'm filled with jealousy because him and Butch got so much going, okay? And they don't. <laughs> and they don't. Um, I, I think that what he's doing now is, see, he's figuring, like I put on the other day, I said, guess what? I said, not only do I put these cases on the internet, I investigate them. Not like the green-eyed monster, ha, ha, ha. Mm. This is his thing. I think he's the one that's filled with jealousy now because we're getting the cases, we're investigating them. He don't investigate them. See? Well, I, I refer to him as a copy and paste guy. That's what he does, yeah, copy I'm, and paste everything. I mean, he sends out a decent email that has a lot of stuff that he copies and pastes and puts together. My problem with it, though, is when I get his email and I get to his, it's, it, it circles and circles and it takes forever mm -hmm. to open. And then I started getting a, a message that said, it's reading my files. Mm -hmm. So I said, that's it. So I went to unsubscribe, I unsubscribe, I got another message that said, you got a server bug. Now I'm not saying Lon sent that directly right, to me, right. but when you copy and paste from 10 different, 20 different sources every day, create these new, you don't know what you're picking up. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think there's another website, uh, I can't think of the name of it, Right Side News or something like that. They say don't open anything, don't copy and paste mm -hmm. from that because it's, it's, it's right. loaded with bugs. Now that server bug, took down, and this is all coincidence, because right, we right. get in an argument with Lonnie, I get the server bug thing, three days later, our Pennsylvania MUFON site goes down, I gotta call GoDaddy mm -hmm. to, re, to get it going, I get all kinds of computer problems, my, my printer gets wiped off, I have to reinstall it, I have to go to Geek Squad to clean my computer, all off of unsubscribing from his email. Well, I, I also got one from my West Virginia MUFON um, website. It said, "Do I really want to cancel it?" Which I never, I never said that. It's it's unbelievable. But, unbelievable. You, you know, I, I think the whole thing boils down to the fact that he he got. I mean, what he got? He he got a good newsletter. Let's face reality here. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of the stuff on there is very good. But like I say, I, I think that Lonnie's a hater. I mean, he's very yeah. vindictive. Yeah. Um, you know, he likes to cut people down and make himself feel good. He got a radio show. He does the same thing on a radio show. Um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, you know, you're never going to change him. He's going to be the way he is. Yeah. So, but you know, like you say, at least when you go to get on, it goes around. I can't even yeah, <laughs> do that. It's like you can't even open I'm it. Whatever's attached to it. Yeah. And then, you know, you got to look at credibility with people. You were a former police chief, right? right. You guys are teachers. You run the uh, planetarium. I was a security director for three states. Who's his biggest buddy, Butch Witkowski? Falsified his Vietnam record, falsified his police record. These are the guys that people want to listen to. So I, you know, I say, are we interested in entertainment? Because they're both entertaining. Right. Or are we interested in getting to the truth? And not only that, Lonnie made the statement on there that MUFON investigators are not capable of investigating cryptids. And, but they're uh, all they, certified. And, uh, and my thing is, like, I put on there that, you know, I put my education, my investigative experience and everything, and he took it straight off. What he does is he runs his page with everything he wants to put negative about you, mm. and if somebody puts something positive on it, he'll take it right off. So if you look at his webpage, it's all negative, nothing positive. Yeah. You know, so. Well, you know, MUFON's the, the largest and the only international organization left to investigate UFOs. Right, right. And I, I see these, and I even see it, like I've said before in conferences, there is this thing where the, you know, they have these conferences on the West Coast. You never ever see the MUFON people invited to mm. speak. Right. We do the investigations, <laughs> yet the people that are on the speaking circuit are researchers mm -hmm. who just get on their computer and pull stuff up and then talk about it like they were there. We were there, right. but yet you don't see any of us. I mean, you know, even myself with two years on Hangar One, I've received zero request to be on any conference to speak. You know, it, it's incredible, but it's a, it's like a, it, the MUFON haters is the way I refer right. to it, you know? All right, let's continue with uh, this whole space program and all of that. I came across this book, uh, and I read it uh, maybe about six, eight months ago, called Kennedy's Last Stand, Eisenhower, UFOs, MJ-12, and Kennedy's Assassination by Michael Sala, PhD. 
I wanted to get Salah to speak at our conference. I thought he lived in California, and people tell me he's in Hawaii. Well, mm. I'm not paying for a no. flight from Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> it's too expensive. But he's written other books. Did you mention one book that Salah wrote? Did you guys I, mention I it? Uh, he's written a couple, a couple of books, but uh, loaded with information, and I dog-eared I dog a lot of pages. But what he did right in the back, the last chapter was kind of sum up his whole book. So rather than go page by page, and there's more detail, obviously, mm -hmm. in that. I want to just tell you guys what, what, what he said, and, and we'll talk about, maybe well, I'll stop, but um, he said, Kennedy's decision to share CIA classified UFO files on November 12th, 10 days before his assassination, uh, was his last stand against the Majestic 12 group. The CIA had systematically denied the Kennedy administration access to classified UFOs. Five years earlier, President Eisenhower decided uh, that he would threaten MJ-12 with the use of the U.S. First Army to Area 51. Right, right. That if, if you don't tell me what's going on there, I'm sending the First Army right. in there. And he got kind of some of what right. he was looking for. But uh, Eisenhower understood that he lost control of MJ-12 and, and, and the president. Think about this. And it shows how, you know, we give the president so much credit. Mm -hmm. They don't have their finger on a lot of things going on. Uh, they really don't. But uh, Eisenhower's uh, final farewell address was the one that talked about the military industrial complex, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the part that I found interesting was um, Eisenhower and Kennedy were really close. Eisenhower, you know, kind of took Kennedy under his wing. Same thing with James Forrestal, right? And they had meetings, and Eisenhower told Kennedy the truth about Majestic 12 and, and the whole, uh, what was going on with UFOs. Now get this, I never knew this. Kennedy was originally, when he was like a 23-year-old officer or whatever, mm -hmm. um, Forrestal took him under his wing. But when Kennedy was in the Navy, uh, he was an intelligence officer, he was briefed on the Battle of L.A. in 1942 and developed a close working relationship with James Forrestal. And uh, Kennedy also wrote a book called Prelude to Leadership, and he wrote about his meetings and examination of Nazi technology that was acquired in Project Paperclip. Kennedy knew a lot more about the UFO thing than, than I ever, re I ever or, realized. Or, mm. Forrestal hoped to recruit Kennedy to his personal staff. Kennedy decided to go into politics, but Forrestal uh, then became the first Secretary of Defense and was a founding member of Majestic 12. Right. I mean, you see this, the relationship there and, and what happened. In 1947, Kennedy learned about the Roswell craft crash in a briefing from Stuart, Symington, and Forrestal. Symington was the guy who drove Forrestal to Bethesda Naval Hospital. You know, mm -hmm. so you see the connection there and the connection with all of these guys. Forrestal has a mental breakdown, which was a lie. Um, he didn't right. have a mental breakdown. Uh, he was giving unauthorized briefings about UFOs and they had to silence Forrestal. And in the other pages, which are more detailed, one of the, the, la the, the last person to s visit Forrestal to change his mind, LBJ. Mm -hmm. Lyndon Baines Johnson. Wow. And who is Kennedy's vice president when he gets assassinated? Mm -hmm. LBJ. Mm -hmm. There's this circle, you know, the six degrees of, uh, of assassinations, right, right. or Kennedy, or UFOs. There's this tight circle there with these guys. And of course, Forrestal, he gets thrown out the window. Kennedy gets uh, assassinated, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Kennedy was receiving secret UFO briefings relayed through his brother Bobby Kennedy from Lieutenant uh, Colonel Corso. And Bobby Kennedy was a card-carrying member of the amalgamated right. flying saucer group. 
I never knew that. No. Yeah. Back then, it was that's what they did. Uh -huh. You know, uh, you had the the, the the senator was part of uh, NICAP, but, the one that ran for president. I mean, today they never do that. But, mm -hmm. but back then, it was much more. Open. You look at that, and you remember the, the TV show Dark Skies? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. That was everything that you're saying now was in that movie. Yeah. Uh -huh. the, the Bobby Kennedy used to meet the guy, and he would tell him what's going on, mm -hmm. and that's why his brother was assassinated in the whole nine yards. Yeah, I mean, the, mm. it's absolutely uh, amazing. You know, we know about Corso with his book with Bill right. Burns mm -hmm. on the day after Roswell and how we back engineered everything, right? Mm -hmm. Now, so Kennedy shared his UFO secrets with Marilyn Monroe because they were an item. You right. know, everybody knows <laughs> that at, at this time, at point. And uh, he was, uh, he and Bobby were warned by FBI Director Hoover to cut their association with Marilyn Monroe. Well, apparently she found, they, oh, no, they did. What happened was they did cut her off and they were no longer dealing with her. Well, she gets infuriated and uh, she plans a press conference. And that other woman uh, was part of this too. Oh, I can't think of her name. Dorothy Kilgallen. Kilkenny? Huh? Dorothy Kilgallen. Yeah, Kilgallen. Right. She was all part of this. She was a reporter who did a lot of stories, mm. and she dies of a suicide, what, months after Marilyn and she Monroe's... Died of a drug overdose. A drug overdose. Mm. Months after Marilyn Monroe's drug overdose, mm. right? So, get this. This is, you know, Bobby visits her. It's not LBJ this time. Right. But Bobby visits her uh, to try to convince her to calm down, not to do the... Uh, the uh, news conference, mm -hmm. he has two agents with him. He doesn't know these agents are linked to MJ-12, the CIA guys. They came, they were going to kill Marilyn Monroe. But by having Bobby Kennedy there, they are now able <coughs> to blackmail him. So Bobby didn't know they went to kill her. They gave her the injection. Right. They killed her. He's there. Now he's implicated. They own Bobby Kennedy. Right. He's blackmailed. I mean, a really, really interesting, uh, you know, line here. Um, Kennedy and Forrestal both believed in transparency. The people should be told about all of this, mm -hmm. about the mm -hmm. about UFOs. They talk about Kennedy's famous speech in '61, which we've played here about secrecy and and secret mm -hmm. groups and, and and all of that. Well, Kennedy decided, and it's true, on November 11th, he sent a memo to Khrushchev that he wanted to cooperate with the Soviet Union in a joint space uh, lunar missions to share information, share classified CIA files on UFOs. The uh, CIA director is Alan Dulles, airport named after him. He's also the head of MJ-12 at right. that time. So head of the CIA, head of MJ-12. Just like the Hill and Carter was the first CIA director, mm. he's on the board of NICAP, a UFO group. Mm. Is, mm. Isn't that uh, uh, amazing? Uh, I never heard of this. Project Environment is an assassination directive from the MJ-12 and the CIA against any official that threatens the UFO secrecy and MJ-12. Project Environment. Mm. No American president has ever been able to use a similar threat like Eisenhower to invade Area 51 because they would be assassinated. And Bill Clinton has said that. He says that they would kill him if he, if he found out. Yeah, but, but, but see, again, what kind of government do we have? I mean, if, if you got a bunch of rogue CIA people running around spending black budget money and, you know, and they're going to tell the president of the United States what to do, then we might as well not even have a president. Yeah, uh, it's I not mean, what you know, we... See, no, no. I mean, it is not at all. So they say, <coughs> and here it is. Vice President Lyndon Johnson was a, an, an asset of MJ-12 since at least 1949. Yeah. He was involved in the Kennedy assassination, the Forrestal assassination. Uh, anyone, intru uh, anyone threatened to reveal UFO secrets would be eliminated. Forrestal, Marilyn Monroe, and Kennedy were all eliminated. I mean, great book to read, a lot of detail, really interesting. We're out of time. That's the end of this show, and uh, we'll talk about these other books on a future show. So thanks for being on, guys. Thank you.